I'll be talking mainly about chapter 3 and chapter 8 today and it's a very non-technical and very conceptual general talk so it's a good opportunity to be a bit more interactive to ask questions, to show how much you've read in the book and um, chapter 3 it used to be chapter 5 in the first edition of the book, was the chapter that I enjoyed writing the most, I think. I had a legal assistant, uh, a young lawyer who n needed to do, um, you know, an internship for like five months with RFF. And so I got the, well, we, someone sent around a question, does anybody want a lawyer for five months? <laughs> like, so he was free for RFF. And so I said, yeah, me. Well, he could help me write a chapter on the origins of property and the origins of law. And he did, and it was, a, it was wonderful. I learned a lot from this guy. And um, it's, it's a fascinating topic, I think. It's, I think it's the most fundamental of all policy instruments. And I, you know, I was seriously wondering, where does property come from? What is it? You know, um, just as a digression, there's um, a carrying capacity of land varies a lot from one place to another. Some places, you know, you'll get uh, um, a yield of five or ten tons of, of biomass every year from each hectare. Some places, I think this is taken from Ethiopia, so some of you know this, uh, it varies a lot and some years there's not enough rain and, and so there are some places where you really don't know what the yield will be and if the yield is very uncertain and is very low, then it's not really worth the cost of defending private property rights. Because you're going to defend private property rights, you need to put up fences, and that's a cost to fences. And you have to make sure the neighbors don't kind of creep in. And all that's quite costly, and if the yield is sufficiently low, it doesn't really pay. So that's quite a, a problem. Um, I sent around the... Uh, well, I sent around quite a few articles, I'm aware of that, <laughs> so I don't know. It would be uh, unexpected if you read everything, but I sent around, the last thing I sent around was Garrett Hardin's article uh, in Science uh, uh, in 1968, I think it was, The Tragedy of the Commons. And it's a fascinating article, I reread it now. Uh, it's r it's, it poses some very big picture questions about population, how many people can we be. He certainly not, uh, he does not believe in growth forever, Mr. Hardin. He's more Malthusian than that. He believes that um, if, you know, we're going to have to choose. And he, he speaks of, um, you know, I mean, he speaks about a lot of things, about nuclear power and about population and about uh, uh, all kinds of things, but in one passage, he speaks about this, uh, the herdsman. In some sense, maybe, as I mean, this could be this guy we had here. Uh, that's in Ethiopia. Um, who, um, but he can also be a symbol, of course, of, for, for other activities. But each herdsman seeks to maximize his own gain. And, um, the moral philosopher Bentham says that the goal of society should be to get the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And uh, Hardin is a bit ironic about this and says that first of all, this is poor mathematics because you can't maximize two things at once. Um, so it's not an operational thing to do. And secondly, you can't really have a maximize the number of people um, and have a high uh, income for each because we're going to run out of resources. And um, he speaks quite a lot about, you know, the freedom to, to breed. 
I think he probably would have liked the Chinese one-child policy. So, maybe, maybe Hardin inspired that, I don't know. And he also speaks about um, how necessary it is to enclose the commons. And I'm going to speak about enclosing the commons quite a lot today. Eleanor, who so sadly died some year ago, um, she kind of devoted her life to proving hard and wrong on one particular point. Uh, that is that uh, she says it's not a tragedy of the commons. The commons can be managed. Commons are managed uh, collectively. And I'll be speaking more about the commons. In fact, I kind of grew up with this. Uh, my address, in, as I grew up as a kid in, in London, was 8 the Common. The street was called the Common, and in front of the house there was a park, a triangular park, with chestnut trees. And, um, well, London's been a city for a long time, but probably about 500 years ago this was a village. And um, where my house was, people perhaps had fields. And the common was a common. That is, that's where villagers could keep, uh, pick firewood and um, have maybe a, 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 some sheep uh, if they had, or chickens or whatever they could have had. Um, and um, these have been quite strongly protected by the law because. And you can see this in London. There are lots of commons. Well, mine was called Ealing Common, but there, is, there are many commons in, in London, which are now parks. But they've been protected. It's been legally impossible to build on them somehow. So. Um, and Eleanor set out in this book to write a, an econometric study of, of what makes uh, common property resource regimes successful. And uh, I guess that's a sort of a bit of a secret because uh, she never, that project completely failed. There's no econometric analysis in there at all. She tried for a long time. Uh, and it was, at least when, uh, in 1990 when she's doing this, the issues seemed too complex. Instead, she, she managed to formulate seven rules that we'll come back to. Uh, and, and that are much more based on intuitive knowledge somehow than econometrics. And it was maybe the most important book in getting her a Nobel Prize. So sometimes if you fail with your econometrics, <laughs> um, anyway. So I've been wondering what comes first. This is a chicken and egg kind of question. Property or law. I, I spent some time, I actually, I remember the book I read as a child uh, by a guy called Conrad Lawrence who studied aggression in animals. I think I was fascinated by these tigers and dogs and, and other things. And it seems that animals have some sense of property. A well, simple one, but they will protect their, their, their hide, or their den. Uh, they will protect their bone if they're, if they're a dog, their food. Um, and Conrad Lawrence writes about this, the two dogs who meet. They will have different territories. I mean, not all animals are territorial. Uh, is there a pen somewhere? Yeah. Um, but you can imagine there's, a, there's one big dog here and one smaller dog over here. And then, so this has a big territory, and this has a, a smaller territory. I'll move him. Oh, yeah. um, now, if they. Um, okay, you can have some legs and a tail. Um, and if they meet here, the big dog will just sort of eat the little dog. <laughs> well, you know, he's bigger. Um, but if they meet here, right at the center, very close to the, to, the, to the, like the den of the little dog, he has to fight, basically, or he's gone. 
you know. And so he would become more aggressive the closer he is to the center of his uh, you know, den. And so yeah, then the big dog was, yeah, well, leave, leave him alone over there. You know, he, he has this little, you know, I'll let him be there. So that's, and the, the size of the territory is sort of a reflection of this as well. I don't know. I mean, this is very, a little amateurish. I'm not sure how, how much that says about human behavior. But obviously our first properties must have been our food and our, and our tools and, and our, our first caves or wherever humans dwelt. It's interesting to, I mean, one of the first laws we know about uh, are the Ten Commandments, which have quite similar um, Jewish and, and Islamic counterparts. Right? So, but the, the, the Ten Commandments in the, in the Christian Bible, I've summarized them here rather uh, e e simplifying things. The first three commandments are, are like that you must believe in the right God and not have other gods. And of course, if you don't believe in those, then of course the rest of the, the others, the whole kind of law falls. You have to believe in, in, in the law, otherwise the law has no meaning. Right? Then there's uh, two laws on, on not working on the Sabbath and on respecting your parents. Then laws 6 to 8 are, I think, the center of, of, of a lot of legal systems. You shouldn't kill, you shouldn't commit adultery, and you shouldn't steal. So number 8 is really the one that defines property, or presupposes property, if you like. But this is very fundamental. So, religion, in this case, or law, I mean, religion was serving the role of law here, I think, um, says that we must respect property. That's quite important. I mean, that's a message, that's a clear message to the poor, because that applies. It's, it doesn't say, you know, you generally have to respect property. It says you always, you should never steal. <coughs> So that even applies to the rich, so the poor can't steal from the rich, which is an important um, rule in keeping <laughs> capitalist order, if you like. Law ni 9, or Commandment 9, is that you shouldn't give any false evidence. And that's, that's fundamental for the existence of a, of a court system. Uh, so if you're going to, and if you're going to, if you're going to make sure that laws number six to eight are actually applied, you need um, you need courts and and uh, a, a legal system of some kind, and therefore it must be a crime to give false evidence. Otherwise, that system won't work. Commandment number 10 is interesting. It's an internalization of the psychology of the other laws. Not only shouldn't you kill or steal, you shouldn't even want to take other people's property. You should not even feel envy of others' house, wife, or other property. It's also clear that the subjects of the law here, the, the, the people, are men. Uh, women are only enter as objects of law here. If we were, you know, if this was going to be rewritten in Sweden today, we would write uh, that you shouldn't feel envy of other, if other people have nice spouses uh, instead of, you know, nice, nice wives. But, um, um, so this, the law here defines property in a way. And um, and I also I, I learned from my legal scholar, he dug up enormous amounts of of documents and studied the particular development of law in, in Great Britain, where after the uh, sort of the Norman invasion, the the, the kings I think I have this here. Uh, uh, after the 11th century, we had the development of feudalism. A feudalism in its time, I mean, now we think of feudalism as something old, but of course at some point it was something modern, and uh, it was actually a liberated, uh, it implied technical progress, larger scale, 
a division of labor. Um, and uh, it was a very hierarchical system where the king kind of would give a number of lords uh, a, a rather large part of the country in return for them providing armies to the king. And then the lord, he would have a group of friends and who were sort of smaller lords who were his dependents and they would ha have to give him soldiers and and supply him with food and then he sort of gave them smaller parcels of his land and all the way down to the individual peasants and there was a process of bargaining that took hundreds of years where the um, the peasants at the bottom of this uh, they were being forced to to send their sons as soldiers. They were being forced to give a tenth of their product to the church and maybe a quarter to the landowner and they were being forced to work on the landowner's fields and all this. In return, they also wanted something and they typically wanted ten-year security. Just like young professors do today. Um, <laughs> so they wanted, uh, they wanted basically to uh, uh, be sure that they could stay in their house and, uh, and, and give their house and their little plot of land to their children. And so that's, that's where the modern concept of, of, of land rights come from. And I'm going to talk about land rights because, uh, well, I'm going to talk about a succession. Land rights and then water rights mm -hmm. and rights to wildlife and to minerals and eventually to like outer space and radio waves and, uh, and the right to put trichloroethylene into the air or carbon dioxide into the atmosphere or, uh, because, because I think that's the best way to understand those rights is by understanding them, you know, we, we start with the, with the easiest rights. Now, you're free to, remember you're free to interrupt. Um, a country like Sweden, yep. You did. You had, I think, I think, I, I did study a bit of Roman, but actually when I, I studied some Roman law here with this scholar for this chapter and um, so I, a bit about Roman water law and Roman wildlife law. I don't, I don't know too much about um, their land titles and what kind of, t I mean obviously the nobility in Rome, they owned houses and you know the land on their house and there was probably no doubt about that. But I don't think it was like, I mean, this is, so uh, this is Sweden. Uh, there is not a parcel, almost, that is not sort of assigned to someone. Sometimes the parcels can look, they're not all exactly square. Right? Um, and there are some pieces, this is actually from where, my, where we have our farm. And uh, so this is ours, for instance. Uh, belongs to my wife and her family. Uh, and there are some little, this little piece here is actually common property. It's, it's, it was a place where they excavated sand and then it became kind of marshy and now it's like a, it's mainly water and kind of like that. So, but it's very small. And there are a few. You'll, sometimes you'll find a little piece of first that is common property. It, it may be it belongs to the, the village. There were some, some schools sometimes would have a little forest. It was kind of a part of financing the school. Uh, and there could be a village can have the right to a, a sand pit. The village can have a right to a road, or one neighbor can have the right to a road, even if it's on someone else's property. And there are these little complications in the rights. But basically, every single square meter of Sweden, you can sort of, on 99% of it, you're going to say it has an owner, and maybe in some small percentage of cases, it, it could be common property, but then it, it is still regulated common property. There, you can find a person who is responsible for the association that, that you know, uh, 
if, it's a, if it belongs to the village, then the village has to have a, an association and a chairman who you know, sign. Because there has to be the right. Someone may cut down the trees and sell them, and you have to know which account to put the money in. And so every single square meter is basically assigned. That isn't the case in all your countries, quite. And um, so in Ethiopia, for instance, well, maybe the Ethiopians want to tell us, but uh, only, there has been a, historically a long history of reallocation of land. So um, every generation or so in the past, people would gather in the villages and they would sort of, you know, they would say, well, you, you know, you, you have a lot of land and no children and like, uh, you have just one hectare and five kids and so, so you know, so we reallocate. This system worked for a few thousand years. So just because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't fit into today's world, we shouldn't sort of immediately trash the idea. It's, it's, it worked for a long time. It kind of has a, there's a, it makes a lot of sense to reallocate. But there's one sense in which this is a problem, and that is that today we put so much emphasis into new technology People will drain their land, they will put in expensive pipes, they will terrace the land, they will build expensive roads, bridges, and whatever. And these investments are crucial in raising the productivity of the land. And it's kind of obvious you really don't want to do a lot of heavy <laughs> investments in land if you're going to be, if it's going to be reallocated to someone else. What would you say? In most of your countries, uh, are there are land rights secure these days? In Zambia, they are not. They are not? Yeah, but then you, you find our, our... I always think about land in relation to, to the agriculture sector, or something like agriculture. So, when you think of the agriculture sector, you sort of like have two sides of it. There's a commercial side, that sounds like a long time at first, but then like two generations later, suddenly there's not so much left of the 99 years. Uh. Yes, of course, there is this principle that we, that is, that we I'll talk about later in, in sort of the, the, the idea of grandfathering. Uh, that you've had them for 99 years, if, if you behaved, if you are still a farmer, still in the same village, using the land, and you haven't misbehaved, and of course misbehaved could be a lot of things, I mean, but first of all, you're not a criminal, and you haven't moved to another country and whatever, but yeah, maybe you have to be a member of the right party or, or whatever. <laughs> Uh, then presumably they'll, you know, they'll hand out the land to you for another 199 years. But there is some uncertainty. And in Ethiopia, sadly enough, uh, during the Derg regime, um, in the, what is this, the 70s, 80s, um, this, this property, the sort of reallocations got, got badly abused and, and you had to be a member of the right party and, and then you got land and otherwise you didn't. And in Zimbabwe, of course, uh, Mugabe is rightly, and I mean, it's reasonable to be fed up with the fact that there are a few hundred white people who, who own most of the land, but uh, then <coughs> if you take the farms and give them to your wife and your nephew and stuff, then you're not <laughs> really <laughs> perhaps doing the right thing anyway. So, um, And um, I think that in Japan and in China there are there are other systems that I know little about. I don't know. I mean, uh, but I, I gather that ultimately most land sort of belongs to the state again. But it's farmers can still have 
fairly strong traditional rights uh, the village. And now things are, there are processes in place, I gather, in China to sort of give, and I think starting with farms, to give farms, farmers farmland, and then now maybe forest land is being also discussed, but is that... <coughs> So I get the question if we can have tradable permits for carbon dioxide in Africa. And, um, you know, um, there's a little uncertainty in how to answer that question, I feel, because I mean, if we haven't really got definite ownership of land yet, then I think even just the, the concept, sort of quite understanding the concept of, of permanent ownership of the right of emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and, and the consequences and how you would trade that kind of right, it, it takes a long time. My, um, my wife's great-grandfathers for, I mean, for 500 years, they have had title to this land. They were very poor. There were people who, you know, they would die of starvation if it was a bad year. They would die if a bear came and kind of scalped them. Um, they, they could die for all kinds of reasons. They didn't have... Conditions were, on the whole, a hundred years ago, I don't think they were really uh, richer than in developing countries in any way. But they did have property rights. And I, it's an interesting question what importance that has had for, 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 for the rate, for the speed of development. Uh, I don't know. It certainly makes a... a, a uh, um, I mean, we have a tradition of planting trees. And our trees take a hundred years to grow. Um, we wouldn't be doing that if we didn't own the land, I don't think. You know, like, <laughs> that was, it's, it's quite a lot of work. So. It makes a difference. Um, in, um, the, the landowner also has quite different rights in different countries. And, and the, the British American tradition is that the landowner has the rights to basically everything. You know, they have the right uh, to what is under the ground, the so you can earth. dig and, you know, what? All the way to the center of the earth? Yeah, sort of all the way to the center of the earth and all the way out, you know, up, out into space. <laughs> <laughs> and you have the right to uh, shoot your own gun in any direction on your own land. And the right would stop, as you haven't got rights. The bullets are not bullets supposed to pass right. into, into the, you know, but if you have a big enough piece of property, you can shoot in any direction, including at trespassers who might, you know, come in. And in Sweden, you don't have that right. Um, instead, you have the right to walk on other people's lands, to pick berries, mushrooms, firewood, well, within reason. You're not allowed to chop down trees. But, uh, you know, so there's, there, but there are some, a lot of rights, in fact. And it's funny how these get ingrained into your, into your spine and your, your thinking. I, if I see a, a nice um, walk in, in other countries, I typically go off and just walk. And I get myself into a lot of trouble with property owners in the United States who, who have their rights to shoot. And so I have to retire quickly, you know. And maybe if we succeed, I mean, there are many problems in, in, in with RED, but if we succeed with RED in some way, then it may speed up, in fact, the creation of some kind of property rights. And then the question is if they will be state rights, local rights, communal rights, or, or private rights. But either way, that might be a good thing. I say might because one has to be careful. I, you get enthusiastic about creating rights. They become permanent afterwards, then perhaps, perhaps they go to the wrong person. <laughs> yes, so.
the nature has its own rights. So yes. This challenges our uh, ecos, our anthropocentric view of the world, and in South Africa too, the, the new water law in South Africa has a similar. A river has a, it's it's a rights as a river. Uh, that is well, that means that there's the river itself has a rights to a minimum flow. And man can, if you, you can have a dam, but, you, but if it's, it's a river, so you can't like reduce the flow to zero. You have to, there's a minimum flow that the river has, I mean. Can you feed the river though? <laughs> no, I guess you can't negotiate with it. The river just, just wants its water. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think that it's, it's a, this is a, a, obviously a green, a progressive green idea. Well, that's the trouble with rights, of course, and, uh, and uh, Hardin questions the rights to, for people to breed freely. You know, all kinds of people, including the least desirable people, they might go off and have lots of children, and then, like, society then kind of has to sort out and take care of <laughs> these children in the end, and, you know, because, so... Um, kind of line of reasoning can get unpleasant, but there is some truth in it uh, as well, uh, up to a certain extent. So, after we talked about land rights, land rights usually are, I mean land is usually in the same place, although not in Bangladesh actually, because Bangla and we have no one from Bangladesh here this year, but uh, Bangladesh there's large parts of the country are submerged about nine months a year. On the three months when there's a drought, land will turn up, you know, and it will move from different, you know, because the river has moved things, so the river subsides, land, your land might be gone, or that might be bigger than last year, and that causes some. But generally land is in the same place, and, um, but water is, is and, and wildlife is, is much more difficult. Um, and there's a couple of different doctrines for, for um, water rights. One of them is called riparian. That's a, a key word here, riparian. That comes from the word river. Right. Riparian rights. And this is a <coughs> nice general concept because you, you sort of you have you have your land rights here and then there's a river flowing through here um, and then you say ah well the river kind of belongs to the landowner that is the closest um, that's a riparian right and so you would imagine if you're gonna if we're going to use this principle to talk about the rights to radio waves or to uh, chemical substances or to the air or to something else, to space, we would say that, oh, anything that is kind of close to the land belongs to the landowner. So that's a riparian concept. But it's not the only concept for water. The, another concept is prior appropriation. And that's also called first, first come, first served, or first in time, first in right, or it's quite close to grandfathering. Not quite the same thing, but they are related concepts. Um, so when the um, U.S. settlers in the U United States moved west and came to California. They came in the search of gold. 
there weren't any strong landowners there. There were, I mean, there were a few Indians that killed them, basically, or shoved them away. Um, and they did not have systems of land ownership quite the way we have anyway. So, um, otherwise normally landowners kind of claim the rivers as well through the riparian concept. But in this case, there was, the land was not very much used for agriculture. And they were looking for gold and you need a lot of water um, when you're treating, washing out minerals and stuff. So, they developed a, a system there where a gold digger, usually a gold mine, could uh, call a river. They could, they could claim, like you stake out, I mean this is the way the United States property rights were defined. Some guy would come along and basically put up a, some poles and say this land is mine. And you, you had the right to, for instance, a common law was you, you had the right to claim as much land as you could walk around in one day. That was uh, in, in the areas where, where Swedes settled up in Minnesota. Um, so in this case, the, um, the gold mines, they, they would claim a certain amount of river. They would say, I need this number of cubic feet or whatever. Liters. They didn't use liters, they used cubic feet, but whatever, it doesn't matter. A certain amount of water, and you had to use it productively. That was kind of important. <coughs> so there weren't many rules here, but, the, but basically, use had to be productive, as you were producing gold or something else, silver, whatever. Um, it had to be public. So you had to kind of stake your claim with a, with a notary or something. You, know, with a, you couldn't just say, oh, but that's what has been mine, I've been using it for like the last 20 years. You can't kind of come along afterwards and say, but you actually have to sort of officially say, now I, Thomas Turner, I'm claiming you know, a million liters of this river for my gold mine. Then you had to register that as a claim. I don't think there was really any cost to doing it, you just had to do it. Um, and then it became yours after some time. And I mean, uh, the rivers were big, so, so you know, there'd be enough water for, uh, first I claim a million liters, the next guy would claim a million liters, and, you know. But eventually, um, there could be scarcity, and particularly in dry years, and then you would, presumably, you, you would, uh, the one with the oldest rights would get his liters first. So if there was a year with less water, I, who claim my rights first, would get my million liters, and then the next guy, and then so there'd be someone at the margin who wouldn't get quite as much. So we didn't reduce proportionally. The older rights got, were like, had precedence. And there are still, San Francisco and Los Angeles still have to pay some of these people, you know, I mean, or the descendants of these people. There are people who own water rights. Uh, and, and big cities have to claim them, uh, pay them. It's kind of an anomaly, you might say. <coughs> then there is um, Spanish water law, which actually comes very much from the Arab uh, occupation of 